thank you for coming. I'm super excited to be here. This is my first time on the campus. And I uh, always ask my friends who work here because like, I'm probably a dork and I watch like the internship and things like that and I get all like excited about being here. So thank you for having me. Um, when they asked me to come and talk about vegetables, that's really easy for me because I worked in, you know, I worked on a farm. I worked in places like Ubuntu and Manresa where it just changes your mind about vegetables when you actually plant something and you see how long it takes to grow and how much care goes into it. How can you make that interesting for somebody who thinks of vegetarian food maybe as like portobello mushrooms and balsamic? So I use a lot of Asian ingredients to kind of bring umami to things and kind of change um, the idea of it. And uh, do you want me to go straight into the demo? And All right, so I'll try to give ideas as to how we could also make this at home a little bit easier than maybe what I'm doing here, which I kind of already did, but we can make it easier. So this is kind of a tomato salad that we actually did. Um, we do themed menus at Nightbird, so every two weeks I change it, and I did a Hey Ladies menu, so everything was sourced from women, whether it was a vegetable, a wine, um, a soy, uh, the music we listened to, so everything on the menu came from women, and I, this salad in particular came from Ten Bring Farms, which is Linda, who's amazing. Her tomatoes blow my mind. And uh, we really just wanted the tomato to shine. So by just adding things like finger limes to bring acidity and soy in tomato dashi to highlight instead of just throwing salt on it, it really just made the vegetables kind of get interesting and not just be a tomato salad. So I'm just going to reference my notes occasionally. but. Um, this could get a little complicated, but for the most part, it's not. We're gonna make a tomato dashi, um, which is tomato water and kombu. I, sometimes when you go to the farmer's market, you get too much stuff, right? Like maybe your tomatoes start going bad and you don't wanna throw them away, right? So I found that making tomato water, which is super easy, is a great way to either have like a palate cleanser, a cold soup, put it into a cocktail with vodka and you have a clarified Bloody Mary. I mean, you can do so many different things with something you would normally throw away. So. Let's pretend that these tomatoes aren't the best tomatoes in the whole world. They're very lovely. But uh, all you need to do is blend them. I've never used this blender before. Let's see. Basically, just blend them till they're water. And this is tomato water. So you just put it through. You can use a napkin, a towel you have at home that's maybe thinner that you would use like at a dinner party, uh, or cheesecloth, which you can buy at Rainbow, Whole Foods, any of the places, and you basically just let it drip 24 hours, set it aside, and through the magic of Google, you have tomato water. And it's basically just the essence of tomato. Uh, right now, we have a tomato salad for the first course, and we do reflection courses, so the first course is a tomato salad, and I didn't want to throw away anything, so we follow it with a palate cleanser of tomato water with olive oil. Another kind of light, refreshing thing you can do. <clears throat> to make a dashi, <laughs> dashi is basically you know, a light broth that is seasoned with kombu and sometimes bonito, but we're gonna do a vegetarian style. And it's just filtered water, the tomato water. Chef, for those not familiar with kombu. So, kombu is a seaweed. Uh, we use a lot of seaweeds in our preparation. On this salad in particular, we cured fish on it um, to kind of tie in the tomato water. You can, you know, it's, I like to use seasonings and it's not just salt. So I'll use soy, so it's not as aggressive. I'll use shiokoji uh, or like a kombu and it just adds in flavor to what is normally just water. And when you're making something like a dashi or a soup or like a miso broth, most of those things are started with dashis or kombus, pardon my mess. And you basically just let it kick it. And then in the end you get dashi. I normally say seaweed, when it starts to boil, can become, uh, make any of your liquids turn bitter. So we never want it to come to a boil. You almost never want really anything to come to a boil, at least in my kitchen, unless you're like boiling water for something like tomatoes, which we will do next. Just because it, by boiling, you're creating friction. It, it creates cloudiness and broth, um, bitterness out of a lot of products that normally wouldn't be bitter. So I always just let things kick it. Everything's kind of like, I have French flat tops in almost every kitchen I've ever worked in actually, and everything's always going around 
the pilot because boiling just is, for the most part, creating not, not things you want near food. So the dashi just kind of kicks it. You go over here and then we'll start plating things for a tomato salad. I like doing different kinds of textures and uh, shapes and sizes to keep things interesting. So we, knife, we'll blanch some. Blanching is, you know, let me see if there's a, something that you wanna do really quickly because you don't want like a cooked tomato like an Italian sauce. You just wanna blanch it quick enough to take the skin off. If they're small, sometimes I don't make like incisions, but sometimes if they're, you know, it, to make it a little bit easier, you can make a little bit of an incision on the skin because uh, the skin will come off. To make anything more refined, you kind of would, you know, take the skins off, but for the most part, I just count in my head like 10 seconds. And then that's normally enough time to not affect the, you know, the actual flesh of the tomatoes, but just enough time to kind of create the, the hot water from taking the skins off. And this isn't too hard to do at home. I have faith in all of you that you would want to do this and impress everybody. Um, so while those are kind of cooling, you want to make sure they're fully cooled because then there's going to be like a cooked stewed tomato. And you really want tomato salads, I think, to be fresh, fresh and like beautiful. So ice water. we, sorry, ice water. Ice is gonna obviously stop it from cooking faster than if you just like ran it under cold water or you know put it in a pot with cold water. Um, you're really highlighting the loveliness of the tomatoes. So I like to cut things in different shapes, you know, so it like looks like it's growing out of a plate or uh, something for you know another tomato to kind of sit on and give height. I use a lot of different colored tomatoes. I mean, there's I worked in Manresa and Love Apple Farms. She grows like 380 different types of tomatoes. And I'm growing a bunch in my yard right now, not as lovely as hers, but um, really just, you know, you eat with your eyes, right? Before you eat with anything. So you gotta impress people nowadays. So lots of colors and bright brightness. So you have like tomatoes cut, you have your uh, tomato water and dashi like kind of happening. Are we all excited to do this at home later? <laughs> um, Luckily, the team here already uh, kind of prepped everything because my staff hates peeling and getting things because uh, it takes up a lot of time when you don't have a lot of time when you know a uh, full service is happening. But as you can see with my hands, it's just really easy. You know, you're just, it was like a quick five, 10 second blanch and the tomatoes are pulled off. So then you're not um, getting, sometimes the skins get, get stuck in your teeth. So it's a little bit more refined. And then at the restaurant, we don't throw anything away, right? So we take the tomato skins, we dehydrate them, and then we turn them into a powder to put back in something on the plate. Um, so again, my staff loves that. I brought a couple things uh, with me that we make. So I say like I use a lot of Asian ingredients. When I'm doing stuff with vegetables, I love pulling from that culture and something like kumquat koshu. I think most people are familiar with yuzu koshu, which is yuzu leaves and jalapenos and salt that are kind of fermented and then turned into a paste. So I thought it'd be fun to do kumquats because one of my farmers had an abundance this year and I just, we just chopped them up, took out the seeds, threw salt and jalapenos on it and just let it ferment. And now it's like this citrus pepper condiment that just like really brings life to the vegetables and to the tomatoes and like some brightness and acidity that you need. Um, you can buy that. I actually, uh, there's a place called the Cultured, um, I think it's called the Cultured Pickle in Berkeley, and he actually makes a kumquat koshu that's delicious. Whole Foods, Rainbow, all those places you can find yuzu, yuzu koshu in any like Ranch 99. I have definitely bought yuzu koshu that's like in a paste, and if you just put like a little bit on the bottom of even like a steak or like on the bottom of a tomato, it just brings a different level of flavor, which is all you're trying to do. So you have different like notes hitting your palate, so you're excited when you're eating or for me. I like to be excited. These are finger limes, which probably are a little bit harder to find. So you can easily supplement by getting limes and just chopping up the segments to give little pops of acidity and, and, and whatnot. Um, they're originally from, I believe, what, New Zealand? And uh, a couple farmers started growing them here. They definitely don't look like the ones from New Zealand. They're really bright and pink and lovely. Uh, afterwards, if you want to come up and try them like on their own, they're just little tapioca pearls, kind of almost like caviar of um, acid. 
and they just bring little pops to kind of surprise your palate while you're eating. Um, I also like using, as in using kombu, agretti and sea beans, which one of my farmers, um, Rin Roots, I think, I don't know if they're at the Palo Alto farm ever, but they're always at the ferry building on Saturdays and the Marin Market on Thursdays. They uh, have a lot of uh, kind of swampy and they can grow a gretti, which is like salty, earthy, um, just brightness. Sea beans grow like at Haven, right in Jack London Square, they used to grow out there. I would not use them, but like they grow in those kind of areas where you can just like have a salty brightness that's not kosher or fleur de sel. And they're lovely. Um, I also like using stuff like togarashi and other kind of like peppers and sancho to kind of give it a little bit of heat. So we just got a little togarashi and some fleur de sel and ground it up that we'll sprinkle on top of the tomatoes. This might be taking it too far if you want to do it at home, but K&J Farms, which is like one of my favorite farms, she grows a lot of great stone fruit. She grows kefir limes, which are bright and green and beautiful. And they're great like just microplane like on a um, salad, but I like to burn them. So I throw them in the uh, oven for about six hours at 500 degrees until the point where they become a charcoal for the most part. But there's so much essential oils in the skins that you like, it still smells and tastes like kefir lime, which I'm sure all of you have had kefir lime before at some point. I brought a fresh one somewhere uh, that if you can see the difference. And it's crazy to me that this was burned for five to six hours and it still has the essence of it. And I just, it just brings it down a notch, but still has that like subtle, like, what is that? Oh, that's kefir lime. I love like the thought of people being like, what is that? And just thinking constantly. So we burned that out. We made the salt, we made the koshu. Tomato water, let's just pretend this dashi is done and beautiful. We're doing it vegetarian style. So instead of seasoning with salt, I like to season with soys, whether it's a shiro, normally it's a shiro soy because it's like a clear, but if you, know, you don't have shiro soy in your house or shio koji, a regular tamari or uh, soy sauce will do. It'll just kind of adjust the color a little bit. And this will make it so it's not just a hit you in your face, like, oh, that's salt. You know, it'll just be like, oh, that's a lovely little like water. Tasting everything along the way too. I make my cooks taste all day long, like from the point where it's almost unedible so they understand where it's at to an hour later to being like, okay, that's where it's at at an hour, here's where it's at at two hours. And so they're constantly understanding the, the process of seasoning and you know, cooking and opening their minds to what it's supposed to be in my eyes. So the tomato water is uh, seasoned and beautiful. We have the blanched tomatoes. Do you want me to plate on like a plate? May I just take this one? You can kind of do whatever you want. I, my go-to oil is, or vinegar is always banyols because I think it's not as um, sweet as balsamic. It's not as acidic as sherry. It's a little bit more refined. Um, I never use something like white vinegar only to clean things, personal preference. But fresh citrus is always a go-to for me. So I thought let's sub it with lemon. So you're getting a lemon dress salad. Um, my hands are clean, but you know, We'll just go like this. You're not going to actually eat this vinaigrette. Um, you don't want seeds. So just like some straight up lemon juice, salt, like right in the beginning. Something that I do in the next salad, you know, I like to crush like garlic and just let it sit it in the uh, actual vinegar and oil. So it infuses maybe some garlic flavor, but it's not going to hit you in the face. It's all about, I think, subtleness with me. So you could do something like that. Editing and doing what you want with a recipe, I think, is why recipes are there. Following a recipe, in myself included, it's never gonna come out, I think, how the person intended. So just throw your own, you know, add more salt, add some lemon zest, change it up and use, you know, I normally use shiro soy, but we're using tamari today. That's how you get creative and start thinking about different ways to like cook. And so recipes are always like a base. That's why my recipes probably weren't the best for these lovely people who were uh, figuring them out. <laughs> They were a little weird. So we have a little bit of lemon juice, a whisk, a fork. You can make it kind of a broken vinaigrette. I always like to use olive oil when I'm making a salad just because sometimes extra virgin gets a little bit too bitter. So since we already have bitterness from like the kumquat and peppers and things like that, I'll just use a straight up olive oil. I use a 90-10 from uh, Skabika, which is a farm in Marin. 
So we barely made any here. Oh, you know what I didn't talk about? The sesame. This one you're going to have to do at home, but you need a Teflon pan. Do you have one? Then we'll fake it. So there is a panda twill, which is basically a bread twill that you make in a pan. We have time, right? <laughs> and you want to get, everyone kind of has a, I think most people have Teflon at home because it makes it so you don't have to clean them as much, right? So everyone has a Teflon, even if you're using it for a purpose that's not for Teflon. Um, a panda twill is basically something that makes this salad look very beautiful. I'll show you on my Instagram what the salad normally looks like, just so you uh, can see, since it's probably not going to look the same. But basically, a panda twill is, uh, it's really easy. This is just sesame paste, oil, flour, and water. I've done this without sesame paste and do it something sweet uh, and just do flour, water, uh, oil, and salt, and then you can add like a dehydrated like strawberry and you have a pretty twill that's gonna be on top of a dessert like a creme brulee that you made at home. Um, I've put it on a lobster salad without sesame paste and it's just brown and we sprinkle a different kind of powder on it so it's a different color. You just basically wanna get this ripping hot and the heat is gonna evaporate the water which will make holes in the twill, which they have some examples in case this doesn't work out perfectly for me right now. But while that is getting hot, I will plate this uh, salad. I always like to you know, season with a little bit of kosher salt, even though we're gonna put on fleurisol as well. And then tasting throughout the whole process, obviously. I'm not going to eat with a microphone on though, so we'll pretend that I did taste. And then plating is like always up to you, something, you know, put your own style on it. I always like to think of food as something like a mountain or a desert and things are growing out of other, uh, this is a little slippery plate, so it might not be it. But like you always want like height. If everything was flat, which is what's happening right now, um, it could be a little bit boring, you know? So this is definitely looks a little bit different than I would normally do at the restaurant, but I think it, you'll get the idea when I show you my Instagram. So you're kind of building a salad and then all of the components that we talked about. I like to just kind of put little plushes almost of like the finger limes everywhere, just so you get little hits of acidity. And then this is pretty spicy. So not like a ton, so not every single bite will coat your palate with uh, pepper. And then have like sea beans growing out of the ground a little bit. This might be hot enough. You basically want it smoking. But I don't know if you can see, but the water automatically evaporates and the holes start which is uh, what gives like the cool kind of effect. And really, my mom can do it, so that means that you guys could. Um, so it's just, I have uh, the recipe I'm happy to give you, but it's just water, oil, salt, and a little bit of sesame paste, and you just shake it up. And it, you really want the pan super hot, but it just starts to create little holes. I made a bunch earlier today, so you will see a better representation of it. Um, microplane is definitely one of my favorite tools in the kitchen because you can zest anything. Herbs are like nutmeg, the kefir, lemon zest, just to give it some brightness. And I just like to go a little bit over with the charcoal. It's one of my favorites. And then kind of uh, garnish with salt. Mm, not my best one, but... I'll steal one of those if there's gonna be any. Uh... I might be forgetting something, but for the most part it's a, oh, tomato water. We make a gel at the restaurant to give different textures, but like you can just pour like a little bit of the tomato water and it'll be like a nice bright salad. So kind of, it's kind of like this. All right, on to the next. 
Thank you. So Chef, I was looking and listening to all the ingredients you have here, and as our program is... I swear it's not overwhelming. Well, what's really interesting is there's a lot of parallels, and Chef Marty can probably contest. We have uh, a huge focus on getting users to enjoy eating more plants and vegetables. And when you have something as beautiful as this and as complex as this, I guess the question is, is what is your philosophy on, on having fruit and vegetables really be at the forefront? You've got so many interesting aspects here. It's very intentional. You've got a lot of flavor, depth of flavor, textures, colors. Has this been something that you've always focused on? Have, has it evolved over time? You know, I think it definitely, like my mind changed when I worked in Manresa, for sure. Um, working with such amazing people like Marty, um, Kinch, Jeremy, James, who I think was here a few uh, weeks mm -hmm. ago doing this, it just changes your mind. And then physically working on a farm, and it's such hard work, and planning things, you really just want the vegetables to shine, you know? And working for Daniel Patterson, obviously, like he's very uh, vegetable um, focused. And there's a lot of different reasons behind that. I think a lot of it is food cost and, uh, sure. you know, just really letting California shine. Like I moved to Chicago for, I lasted one winter and then <laughs> came right back. But the reason why I came back was because I couldn't understand not going to the market every day. I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around manipulating like an apple and then deconstructing it and then turning it back into an apple. Like that's rad and I respect that so much. But for me, I'm not on the length of like Alice Waters where it's like figs on a plate, but I'm somewhere in between. I really just want the tomatoes to be amazing and then have highlights of whether it's an Asian ingredient or a succulent to make that vegetable kind of shine forward. So I think it's definitely grown. Chef Marty influenced me a ton. I mean, just blew my mind when we were working together. I heart him the most. Um, so on to the next, tofu. So one of my first ever dinners, I was paired with Hodo, which Min Tsai is the uh, owner, and it was his first dinner I've ever as a farmer, and I got to go on the first tour to see how it was made. And growing up in a very hippie town, uh, we would get tofu mushroom burgers all a little tipsy uh, after going to parties, and it, I thought it was amazing. And then I tried his tofu, and I was like, what have I been eating my whole life? Like, what is this disgusting stuff in water that you get at Safeway? His tofu, I mean, there's so much fat and protein and so much deliciousness in it that like the soy milk you can drink and you can create so many different products from this that you just start thinking, you know, how can I make this like, f not like meat, but how can tofu be the forefront? How can we make something that people think is gross, really, most people aren't tofu and tepe fans, um, into, wow, I wanna go eat some tofu. Um, so, I love curing things in miso, whether it's a vegetable, curing carrots in miso, curing uh, tofu in miso. It really adds a different flavor and texture to something. And I think that, you know, I'm actually working with Min about hopefully producing something on a bigger level that um, someone could buy at home so they don't have to sit there and get all dirty and, you know, wait for it for, you know, I have some miso that I've been curing for six months to see what happens. I have a lot of weird experiments in my refrigerator. Um, at home <laughs> because we don't have a lot of space at the restaurant. Um, I have some cream that I think has been uh, aging for about two years now. My partner hates it. <laughs> um, but for miso, I think the longer that you let it go, the more moisture is getting sucked out, right? Because it's salty and it's all these things. So this has only been a couple of days and then we, uh, we're gonna sear it. So this was a play on like grabiche, which I love grabiche, and how can we let a vegan or vegetarian enjoy something that I get to enjoy on a day to day because I eat like four boiled eggs a day. Um, so working at Ubuntu and Manresa, we used to do a lot of grabiche, I think, and uh, this was like my kind of play on it. So to make the grabiche, I would take, you can either do just regular, miso, regular tofu or like the miso cured tofu and kind of cut it up, almost emulating an egg. And you can either use a knife or if you want, use a microplane if you want it a little bit more um, kind of uh, soft. I like the texture of like the knife cut of something like a brunoise, so I will cut them like an onion dice or something like that, so you have Sorry, I've only had coffee today, I'm really shaky. I just don't wanna cut my finger. Um, cut it into any shape you want, as big as you'd like. And then I like to use fermented black beans a lot. You can get a container of fermented black beans that will 
probably be okay for your whole life uh, at Chinatown for like $2.99. I like, uh, I think the Yang Liang brand that you can get on Amazon and uh, it's not, they do a flavored one with ginger but I just like the straight up fermented beans. I just think it's a really good substitute for in this case, anchovies, um, or just bringing some umami to the plate that uh, you normally wouldn't have from just salt. Definitely, I don't know if you guys have ever had from, eat them before, kind of get a good grip as to where the salt level is because it can get overpowering. And it has a, I don't even know how I'd explain it, almost like, almost like miso kind of umami. I hate, I've used that word like four times already, but it's, just got a really rich flavor that's gonna bring some depth uh, to a salad that could be maybe boring. Um, we have a couple different components going on. I like to, I'm just gonna take this, add a little bit of oil and then I put chives kind of in everything. I'm that person who eats onions and I think it stems from when I was like working in you know really strict four star kitchens and you had to have perfect cuts of leeks and onions. I didn't want the chef to ever see so I'd eat them when they weren't the perfect cut. And so now I just see myself eating chives and onions for no reason. Now that I'm the chef, I still do it. Um, but I kind of put in shallots and onions and all those things and everything. So a little bit of chives, you can just like, even tear parsley if you don't want to cut it, you know? Or skip that if you don't want to buy a whole bunch so it doesn't go bad in your fridge. Um, I like to put, like I said, kind of shallots and garlic and everything. And you can either cut them really small or just bigger like me since I like to eat them like that. And then you can kind of put it to the side. You normally don't need to add too much salt because the fermented bean is gonna be your salt but tasting, like I said, will always be the way you can tell. With the tofu being cured in miso, that's adding a lot of flavor. So you don't need to add too much. Searing it, the miso definitely can stick. So using actually your uh, Teflon pan is probably a better way to go than what I'm about to do right now because it's gonna stick and burn and maybe smoke out this whole place. So we might pretend a little bit. But basically, you kind of like can wipe off some of the miso. And you can reuse the miso too. Like I'm a big fan of like thinking that there's flavor that has like created into that. A good amount of oil, and it's probably not hot enough, so again, we're pretending. We can just let it like sit there and start to caramelize. You wanna get like a little bit of a brown. If you get a little black, that's no problem. I like charring things a lot. I mean, you don't wanna think cancer black, but like char black where it just like gives a little bit of flavors, lovely. This might be a little bit much at your house, but I love Yuba. So Yuba is kind of in the same lines. It's, we used to, we, we do used to do it with milk and then also uh, soy milk and uh, skin forms on the top. And if you ever get an opportunity to go to a tofu, I don't want to say farm, a, a center where they make it, it's just like a swimming pool of soy milk with these wood, kind of uh, planks and then people just pulling up uh, the skins, literally the skins that have formed from the, the air, and then they just drain. I feel that hodos are the best. The ones that we make at the restaurant don't hold up to frying or aren't like, I mean, this is insane. Uh, and that's because of all the protein that they have in theirs. So I kind of, we make as much as we can in the restaurant. We make our own butter, like our own, everything gets made in the restaurant, but I will not make my own of these because I think that they're good, and we use them. We're a tasting menu restaurant in a you know city that has a ton of restaurants, and so we try to be as accommodating as we can to everybody. So if someone's a vegan, gluten free, someone came in with the whole 30 diet the other day, and I was like, what the? And I'm like googling like what these things are, but we want to make everyone feel welcome. So we have a lot of things to supplement. I always am thinking when I'm doing a menu like. Will a vegan like this, what can I do? So we always kind of have Yuba as a possible gluten supplement if we're doing like a pasta or, you know, a supplement for meat if it's a vegan and it's not the entree course. So I think that I recently have been told I shouldn't eat gluten and sugar, which really sucks. And uh, I, when my staff makes pasta, which they try not to, so I don't feel bad, uh, I'll, they'll make me some with Yuba. And it's a great supplement, just like, Throw it in the water. If you guys have ever been to State Bird, it's one of their signatures, you know? Uh, just some Yuba in a pan, toss it in some garlic and oil. It's amazing. Um, 
yeah, we're faking this. Um, so we at the restaurant, like, we'll fry it. I'm just going to put it in there with it and see if anything happens. Uh, and we fried it a little bit ahead of time to kind of have a crispiness. So you have a couple of different textures. So you're going to have the raw tofu as a garbage, a seared tofu to have, like, the more earthy caramelization flavor, and then the fried yuba as, like, crunchiness. Having a f no texture in something, I think it's people bored. It's kind of like a, along the same lines of not having acidity and brightness and chili. So having different textures gets you interested, especially if it's something like a tofu salad. So while that's frying, uh, we can kind of mix greens. I personally love chicories on this because they're bright and they hold up to uh, what will be the vinaigrette. If you want to do this with like arugula or spinach or anything, like, like I said earlier, making it your own makes it yours. So on this one, we have chicories. To make the vinaigrette, it's kind of like a play on a Caesar salad, which is not vegan, but you can. I've done this dressing with a soft tofu in supplement of the egg. So when you're making a Caesar, you want like a nice ribbon on your egg yolks, and uh, I, we use a roboku sometimes, but I mean, when we're feeling old school, we'll do it by, uh, by hand. I have a way tougher right arm than a left arm. And then once you get it to like a nice ribbon, you add the acids, which for me are a lot in this. I'm actually gonna reference my recipe. It's, uh, I use red wine vinaigrette, rice wine vinaigrette, or vinegar, um, Dijon mustard kind of also holds and makes uh, the vinaigrette stable. So it kind of stays emulsified and isn't like a gross broken egg vinaigrette. I put miso in it to kind of just really bring home the fact that I love using Asian ingredients. And some soy and Parmesan and we'll microplane some garlic up in there. Sorry. Like I was saying earlier with the garlic, you can, uh, to add a little bit of heat without making it insane, throw in some chili, just like a couple pieces, and while you're whisking everything together, it'll like infuse that like chili flavor without like killing your palate. I am a baby with spice. I can't, I can't really uh, take a lot. It could be the 20 years of uh, cooking and drinking and mm, too much coffee, so. I go really light on anything spicy. And again, this is something that like, at the acidity level that you like, the dressing that you like, you can add as much oil or as little. Um, to make it your own. I just maybe, I don't understand how your guys' uh, flat tops work, so. Jared's on it. Oh, we'll fake it. Oh. <laughs> or you can fix it. You can kind of see, I don't know if you guys can see this, by slowly adding a little bit of oil, you're just like creating an emulsification, which is how you make like a non-broken vinaigrette, constantly whisking, how you make an aioli, anything, and then just a slow stream of oil brings it all together, which, I'm not gonna lie, at my house, like I normally just throw a tortilla on a stove and put a little bit of butter on it and that's what I eat. But when I'm feeling fancy, I'll do something like this, which is rare, but it happens. Um, so I'm using, an, I think that's an extra version, you can already taste the bitterness in it, which is fine. Could I just have a plate to plate the salad if you don't mind? When I'm dressing a salad, I never really put it directly on the greens. I kind of always put it like around. So you're not just drenching the greens. You're kind of, it can pick up the dressing along the side and then season the lettuce as well. I'm not a big pepper person. I normally don't put it on a lot, but I, on this salad, I think it's pretty nice. So, sorry, tasting. Pardon my eating. So grabiche is normally like a, you know, creamy sauces at the bottom of the plate. So we'll put it on the bottom. I just did something actually for Bon Appetit, very similar. 
uh, except we added asparagus. So we just roasted some asparagus, a fried egg, and had the tofu gabriche on the bottom, roasted asparagus, a bunch of like beautiful greens and flowers. And, um, and it was, looked really nice. And then yeah, just a little bit of height. And then seared tofu and fried tofu. Sorry, it's not searing. Once you sear it and you get it beautifully uh, brown, just some slices. And you can kind of intermittently put it in your salad so you get little surprises. And then fried tofu chip kind of on top. And then if you want to be fan a little bit around. And super easy tofu salad that has some like meat to it, I think. Okay. Now you get to take a break for a second. <laughs> Sorry, I talk fast and a lot. <laughs> so we have a few minutes for questions. I have a few that I'm going to start off with, but uh, this is always very interactive and we have Chef for another 10 or 15 minutes. So if there are initial questions, raise your hand quickly. Otherwise, I will start. Yes. Besides tortilla and butter, what are some like quick or tired you know, half and half? At my house? Yeah, like what do you make for yourself? What's the question? Yeah. So repeat. when I'm at home and I just worked an 18 hour day and I'm like, what do I want to cook? And it's not a tortilla. Well, it's normally an ice cream bar. No, it's a, uh, I, I was actually on a chow video where it was like, they're like, cook something late night. And they took six chefs, and I'm like, green beans. I love green beans. So it was just like seared green beans and chili flake, and I'll just eat them. I like to eat with my hands, and I would just like cook some green beans real quick, five minutes, throw in some chili flakes, squeeze some lemon, a little bit of salt, done. I wouldn't even clean the sides. And then, of course, like the chefs from the video after me, it was uh, Daniel Hum, and he made a peach gazpacho with foie gras, and uh, Char uh, Charles Fan from Slanted Door busted out his walk at his house and did a whole fried fish, and I'm like, <laughs> looking like a real jerk eating green beans in my ghetto kitchen. Uh, but I do things like that. Normally, actually, I tend to go, I always have rice in my um, fridge. Rice and kimchi is like kind of my go-to with everything. It's what I eat on my day off and when I'm at home to try to stay healthier and satisfied. Ra uh, brown rice and kimchi. It's just always. I always, ha I cook for my dog when I make... <laughs> <laughs> My dog eats better than anybody I know. Um, his name's Ralph, um, but we always have brown rice and chicken for him, so I always, I don't take his food, but I mean, I uh, always make extra brown rice for myself and then have it there because we always have my dog's food. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's what I cook. Yes? What's your favorite thing that you cook in like a restaurant? That's really hard. I know what I get pegged to cook a lot of times. Um, but for me, it's normally this, the simple thing. What everyone, when I have guests come to Nightbird, they still request things that I used to cook at Haven, which is, I think, normally frustrating for chefs. Since I change, it's funny, I change my menu every two weeks and I try not to replicate anything. When I go out to eat, I get the same thing every time, no matter where I'm at. If I'm at a Thai restaurant, that's I order the same thing every time. If I go to like, we went to Blue Plate the other night, I get the meatloaf and the, the, the burgers, and if it, or the meatloaf and the mashed potatoes. And if it comes off the menu, I'm pissed. But at my restaurant, I'm like, let's change it after two weeks. So I think that I have been, actually I'm really happy with my menu right now. I'm doing kind of what I call a crowd pleaser menu, which is like, I really like our tomato salad, so I'm using Ten Bring Farms tomatoes, and I made a burrata. So I got burrata and I uh, emulsified it into a siphon and made it aerated, so it's a little bit more refined with lovage, which I love lovage. It's like this kind of like a fruity celery almost, and it just brings in a pumpernickel crouton with little baby uh, cucumbers from Tucker Taylor, and it's just bright, but it has a creaminess, but it doesn't take away from the tomatoes because it's a spuma. So it's I, I think it's definitely one of my favorite dishes that we're doing right now. Well, for me, I feel comfortable. I mean, I don't put eggs in refrigerators at my house. My farmers never have, from the point when I, I put them in a refrigerator once they get to the restaurant, but like at my house, when I get like a dozen of eggs for me, they sit out on a counter because they never normally see refrigeration and they're perfectly fine. 
but I know where I'm getting them from, I know what farm, I know when those eggs were laid, and I know when I shouldn't use them. And if you ever don't know, put it in some water and you can tell by the floatingness of it if it's gone to the point where you shouldn't eat it. But I mean, eggs pretty much stay good for a good amount of time. But normally I would say get like a half a dozen so you go through them in a week and you don't have to worry about it. But I, I mean, Caesar salad, all those dressings, unless you're buying it from like a bottle in a store at a restaurant, same difference. It's just like an egg yolk, uh, robocoud, and uh, oils emulsified into it. So it's technically raw, but some people say that it's being cooked by the heat from like a blender. I mean, it all says, but I mean, as long as you know where your eggs are, anything actually, as long as you know where everything you're eating is coming from, you shouldn't be worried. I have done pork tartare before. I called it tartarinosis and no one thought it was funny and no one wanted to eat it. But I mean, I feel comfortable eating it because I know what that pig's name was. And I think that's a, I think California's, we're really lucky to be in a place where the farmers care and are at farmers markets every day. And I know you guys are super busy. You can't go to markets every day like I can. If I had a job like yours, I probably wouldn't either. But just going like on a Sunday or something and then that lasts you for the week. I mean, you also have amazing chefs cooking food for you here. But when you feel like cooking at home, I mean, I think there's a really amazing farm not far from here, a farmer's market not far from here that a lot of my farmers go to, or if you're ever in the city, like the ferry building, and just ask them too, like, when was this picked? When did, when did you kill these, uh, you know, rabbits? And they'll tell you because they know, because they did it. Uh, she, she raises a good point. Just a show of hands, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot. Who here regularly shops at farmer's markets? So I think it's a, it's a good uh, point that Chef makes is to, to really get out there and know where your products are coming from. I think the food industry for many, so many years has hidden what we, the story behind the food. And I think what Chef Kim is doing is actually celebrating that. So when you have time, uh, when you have time, really get out there and see, what, see where those local farmers are. So first of all, I actually keep tea and brown rice as my roommate. And I so that was a great funny room. Um, so I'm really interested in learning more about Well, I've done, okay, my mom was just here yesterday, and so I did a menu for my mom um, a few months ago because she went blind, and through the grace of God, like a year later, a surgery happened, and she got transplants, and now she can see again. So when she was blind for that year that I was aware of, I started making a menu that I was hoping that she could appreciate. Uh, a lot of it touching with your hands, a lot of things that were just all white or all brown, because she could see blur, she couldn't see people. And then before the restaurant opened, she was able to see again, so the dessert was all color and like flowers. So it was like, I try to have a very personal connection with each menu. Um, but then I also sometimes, like my last menu, being a little creatively drained and dealing with a lot of stuff at the city, it was like summer textures. So it was obviously things that are at the summer, or things that are at the farmer's market that are really bright, tomatoes and corn, and then trying to put a technique on it. But I'm, I'm working on a menu right now of like, a lot of famous chefs have died this year. Um, so I'm doing a menu of inspired by, each course inspired by a different chef who's passed away. Um, that cohesively can kind of come together. Um, I try to pull from pop, I did a Christmas story menu uh, at Christmas, so it was like, I don't know if you guys have seen a Christmas story, it's my favorite, and my dog's named Ralphie, um, but you know, every course had something to do with the movie, or I've done a, you know, I'm doing a menu right now built with a musician, like each course is a different like song that he has written. So I try to do stuff that interests me, that's fun and a little kitschy, but also has a cohesiveness to it. And, um, you know, it just depends on my creative level at the time. I'm, I'm getting more sleep now, so it's getting a little more creative. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For someone who didn't go to school, Technique, I mean, if there's so many cookbooks now. When I was starting off cooking 20 years ago, it was like on cooking and I know. But now it's like chefs are coming out with cookbooks three years after being open, you know, and, it, and so there's so much out there. Omnivore cookbooks in San Francisco, Cecilia is rad. She, it's kind of like a kitchen arts, which is in New York. 
books that are inspiring to me right now that you know that you could take technique and actually do them without having to buy 20 modern ingredients i would say you know i really like the astronauts cookbook it's like i think it's called a, a cook it's a book for cooks it's um a restaurant in paris that's beautiful i really like that and i i mean any book just I think pictures inspire people. When they start reading the recipe, sometimes you just glaze over. I'm guessing sometimes like when you're reading code would be the same thing. So when you see these bright, beautiful pictures and then you went to the farmer's market and you see those same things, I think that's inspiring. So if you're in the city, I highly recommend going to Omnivore Cookbooks and she will find you whatever it is you're looking for. But I think that just using your imagination and like looking at the pictures like will, will make you push forward and create something, I think. But honestly, on cooking, I mean, I, it was my first cookbook that I got in culinary school, and it teaches you a lot of technique and how to like do some butchery and things. So it at least gives you the base, so then you can like move on to you know the Alinea cookbook. I have a friend who um, was in tech, and he got the Alinea cookbook, and he cooked his way through it, you know, and uh, did every single uh, recipe, which is more than I can say for myself because that cookbook's insane. When you have catalogs and the places you have you what would you say are your top five favorite restaurants? I've traveled, I mean, I've been pretty ball and chain to my restaurant, but I've been to Dubai and Zurich and Paris in the last few years. And I mean, actually outside of Paris, I was most entranced with like Renoulaire. And then I mean, at Estrance, uh, in the city, I go very casual and I love sushi. I, you know, Japan's definitely in my next place, but um, I had an amazing meal at Juni. Um, I was just in Zurich and I'm actually hosting a chef at my restaurant. His restaurant's called Jacob and it was very much like-minded like me. And, um, you know, I, and it's random, but like in Dubai, going to Toro was like delicious and like very eye-opening um, because I can't remember all of the names of the places I went and ate lamb brains. But uh, those would be some of the restaurants in the last few years I've gone that were inspiring to me. Excellent. Well, let's give a huge round of applause for Chef Kim.